Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Andrew Ryder. Andrew is an executive coach who learned early in his career that true success is defined by a clear mission and healthy, meaningful relationships, not necessarily money or acclaim. He now coaches entrepreneurs on how to become intentional, ethical, and even vulnerable leaders who focus on the present and set themselves apart. I'm excited to have him on the show to talk about the idea of doing things the right way and how that will organically lead to more business. So Andrew, welcome to the show. Thanks, John. I'm, I'm excited to be here. You know, I think we, uh, we have very similar philosophy, philosophies, but we're kind of taking it from a slightly different um, area. So I'm excited to talk to you and uh, just, you know, talk about philosophies and leadership. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to have you on the show as well. I think there's some stuff that I think everybody who listens to this podcast and who is in a leadership role uh, is going to get a lot out of it. So one of the things I want to start off with is that is for you to tell us a little bit about your story. And, and as I understand it, when you 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 know you started off and you were you were on your entrepreneurial journey, and then suddenly you realize that you know every, a lot of the stuff is people are doing things the same way. It's clickbait. It's uh, click funnels. It's it's more of the I don't know the systems and less the the people. So when did you realize that this typical entrepreneurial hustle felt hollow? It just didn't feel right. Yeah, you know, I started out and I didn't know entrepreneurship even existed until I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, mm. which uh, is a really popular book in like the real estate space. Uh, it's not so popular in, in other entrepreneurial realms. But when I read that book, I just remember thinking, like, I didn't even know, why didn't somebody tell me sooner that this was even something that you could do with your life? Like I didn't, mm. it never occurred to me that people owned businesses or, or, or you know, bought real estate. It, it was just, you know, I was in my early twenties and was just finishing up college. And I, I got obsessed at that point. I, I had to explore this and learn how to start a business. And I, I just sort of dove in and bought the sort of mainstream idea hook, line, and sinker that, mm. you know, business is about starting some sort of online venture that, that pays you a lot of money and you don't really have to work that hard. So you just go retire to Tahiti and, <laughs> you know, life is easy, life is fun and you yeah. don't really do anything. And yeah. so I tried really, really hard for years to make that my life, which looking back, there's so many things, you know, I, I could never just stop and retire I, I that's just not who I am you know I'm very like have to be doing something have to be um building things or tweaking things or just growing and um you know but that led me down the route of trying all of these sort of biz op type things that you see online and you know they're not useful to the people who you're selling to they're not not good businesses, you know, in, in some ways you could argue that maybe they do provide some value, but really the idea is to make money at the expense of someone else so that you can have a good life or you can have an easy life. Right. right. And there's definitely right. a difference there between a good life and an easy life. And it wasn't until my fiance really got serious about starting her business. She's a nutritional therapy practitioner. So she works with women who are struggling with gut health issues or autoimmune issues, and she helps them with diet and exercise and other habits to get rid of those issues. And when we got really serious about her business, it, you know, I was sort of able to take a step back and look at the big picture. It was her business, and I was, I was helping her with strategy and marketing and sort of tech-related things. But I, I, I realized, and, and we had sort of the misfortune of waste. I say wasting, but not necessarily a waste, but we spent a lot of money on coaches who ripped us off, who lied to mm. us, who took everything yeah. from us. You know, I yeah. was talking to someone the other day and I added it all up and it was like $25,000 in coaching over a 12 month span that amounted to nothing, but just feeling like we were not qualified to do what you know, we've been sold on this idea of helping people and yeah. of building a business of doing something that you're passionate about with your life and helping other people in the process. And yet we were just getting constantly berated and constantly failing. And I just felt really um, 
really drawn to, you know, once we got her business to a point where she didn't need my help every day, I felt really drawn to speak about the things that I learned, the mistakes that I made, and to help other people to avoid those and to really become, become the type of person who's capable of starting and succeeding in an entrepreneurial venture. And mm -hmm. that's kind of where the idea of leadership comes into what I do. Interesting. So, yeah, I think I, I know what you're talking about. There's a lot of, um, well, there's a lot of people out there trying to make money, right, online. They, you know, like you say, there's this vision of, uh, you know, this uh, digital nomad. I can, you know, do some sort, create some sort of online business and, and do it from anywhere I have a uh, Wi-Fi signal, right? And I can, uh, and, and some of these people are ripping other people off, right? They're not, um, they're not helping really. They're just they're helping themselves, but not necessarily helping their clients. Uh, and so, you you saw that firsthand with your wife's business. So, um, yeah. So, so how did you use that experience to change your approach or to sort of set your uh, direction for your your future ventures? So, the the primary thing for me is that it's all about the people. And I know mm. this is something that you, uh, you are really passionate about too. You know, I see it all over your website and all of your, <laughs> your content and everything that you know, it's, leadership is about the people, right? right? And so is online business. It's, you know, it's so easy to get into tracking all of the metrics and my funnels converting at this rate or I'm getting these uh, open rates on my emails, but really it's people on the other side of that screen. Mm -hmm. and, and when you take the effort to really build a relationship with those people, it changes the dynamic in your business. You're, you're less focused on getting their money and you're more focused on helping them, mm -hmm. which, you know, are sort of ironically, when you focus on helping them, they're gonna get better results, they're gonna do better, they're going to stick around with you longer, they're gonna refer other people, they're gonna give you a testimonial. So it's, you're probably going to make more money doing things ethically than by just trying to rip people off all the time. It's really interesting because I think in a way, leading people is that way, right? So if you have relationships with the employees and you are looking out for their best interests, they recognize and they see that. And they, you know, if you're properly communicating mission, objective, goals, they see that you care and they see that you're communicating effectively and they, they tend to want to you know, help the company, improve the company. And so your results end up getting better. But if you just focus on the results, right? If you just focus on, we got to get profits up at all costs and you pound your fist on the table and you, you direct your employee that they have to do this and you have to do this and you have to cut your overtime and you have to work extra and you have to do this then you never get to that uh, that performance. So it's almost like like leading people. If you take care of if you take care of the people, uh, the profits take care of themselves. And it's almost the same way. You take care of your customers. You take care of your clients. You take care of the people behind the clicks. Then it's going to take care of your business. You're going to grow your business. So that's I think that's what you're saying, right? That's absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. You call you call it leadership, and I like it um, because you're really, um, you know, you're leading uh, your customers. You're 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 you know you're 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 you know you're a thought leader, if you will. So you say in your in your write up, you say that leadership is more important now more than ever. So why is leadership so important? Leadership is more important now than ever in the past because there's such a huge chasm where leaders are supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And the more connected the world gets, the more high quality leadership matters. And especially in the online business space, but it's, it's everywhere. It's in corporations, it's in government, it's everywhere. There are people who are trying to take advantage of the system to for personal gain, whether that's power or money or what have you. And yeah, I, I, I love this analogy. So um, have you ever watched the movie 300? 
Yeah, sure. Yeah, so so this is my favorite leadership movie because it just perfectly illustrates the two different types of leadership and how they interact with their people and how they interact with each other. And so the, so the movie 300 is, uh, you know, it's about 2,500 years ago. It's set in sort of ancient Greece and the Persian uh, empire is, they're, they're expanding and they're attacking Greece and Sparta, you know, they've made it to Sparta and the Spartans are in the middle of a festival. It's a holiday. They're not allowed to go to war to defend their lands against the invading Persian army. And so Leonidas, the, the king of Sparta, he goes anyways. He takes 300 people with him. He says, look, if we don't go and we don't defend our country, we're, there's, you know, they're going to wipe us out. We have to go. You, you, you know, we need to go defend our people against this invasion. And so they, they march out and they meet Xerxes, who is the Persian god king. He is immortal in the eyes of his subjects. He is, uh, uh, he cannot be killed in battle. He's perfect, right? And, and he rides in on this giant golden pyramid that's being carried by his slaves who are basically breaking their back for him to carry him in on, on this thing. And, and he walks down and in order to step off of it, a couple of slaves will, will crouch down in front and, and create a set of steps for him. And so he's literally stepping on their backs to get off of this, this throne. And he walks up next to Leonidas, you know, who, who's a little dirty, he's sweaty. He walked the whole way. He marched there shoulder to shoulder with his brothers who were in that army with him. And they trained together, they fight together. And when you compare that to the, uh, to Xerxes, I'm sorry, he is shouting for his people to go and attack or to go around the flank or to do whatever it is that he wants them to do. But he never gets involved in the battle. He sits back and he sends his minions out to do his bidding to die for him. But when you look at Leonidas, you know, he's in the front of the phalanx. He's holding it down. He's leading the charge. And so it's completely opposite styles. And I think we see this, whether it's in some cases in corporate leadership, we see CEOs or, or leaders of companies who are incentivized to make the most amount of money today because they're CEO right now. And if they make money today, it's better for them personally, but it's going to put the company in jeopardy over the long term. You're going to do questionable things that you, maybe you won't get caught in the next five years, but after the CEO retires, well, it's somebody else's problem, right? I made my mm -hmm. money, I got out. Or you see it in online business where people are more interested in sort of fantastical testimonials and all of this hype and, and timers and all of these things to get you emotional, to get you to buy something that then there's really no follow-up on the back end because mm -hmm. it's, it's really just lies. Yeah. at the end of the day. And I see this everywhere. And I also see an opportunity for people to act more like Leonidas, to care about the people who are standing right next to you in fighting this battle for whatever it is that you believe in. You know, a lot of people that I work with are coaches and course creators and, and solo entrepreneurs who care about solving a very specific problem for a very specific group of people. And it's really, it just, leadership is getting into that battle that they're in and walking on that journey with them, of casting that vision out and leading them along the way forever. You know, it's not just today and then, well, sorry, you know, program's over, but it's the long term. It's about the, uh, the journey that you guys are on together. Yeah, no, I like that. I like that. In fact, I think I just wrote a book about that. So it's called All in the Same Boat. So <laughs> awesome. I mean, part of part of being a leader, I, you know, I started my career as a submarine officer in the Navy. And we uh, there wasn't a separation between leaders and uh, workers or leaders and employees. We were, you know, the officers and sailors, we worked together in the tight confines of a submarine, working together on these long watches, always, always side by side, you know. 
just like it, you know the story like the movie 300 we were always together so you can imagine my surprise when i came to the corporate world after the navy and i saw you know uh vice presidents in these fancy offices over here and the people in the shop floor down here with no air conditioning and kind of rough conditions and uh this guy's got you know assigned parking and he's got life is perfect for him and he's getting a very large bonus they they're you know they're being told to you know cut costs and whatever it takes to make the numbers you know and uh yeah so i think it's i think i see that as a big challenge in leadership is how do you uh, identify more with your team and be part of the team, be more present, uh, work side by side. I think those are really big issues that I've always talked about. So it's kind of interesting that you've come along at the, at a completely different way, but you, you, you've come to the same conclusion that it, you know, leadership is about people. It's about those relationships. It's the side by side. It's, you know, instead of saying you go do that, you say, let's go do that. You're, 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 you're in it together. So I like that. You, you, yeah. mentioned, you mentioned the idea of vulnerability as a leader. So why do you see that as important? What, what, what does vulnerability add to this equation? I think there's a sort of a misconception around leadership that you have to be macho or loud mm -hmm. or charismatic right. or, you know, sort of overtly um, leading your your company or your audience and you know some of those things certainly help you you would if you had the choice of being more or less charismatic you'd obviously want to be more charismatic um but it doesn't have to be that way you know you definitely want to be yourself mm -hmm. as a leader and i always come back unless to this. you're unless you're a jerk we always i always say be yourself <laughs> unless you're a jerk Right. So that's sorry. that's fair. <laughs> then then maybe the uh, the prerequisite there is you need to you need to work on yourself to the point where you're capable of of uh, you know leading with with empathy or um, right right you know proper leadership. But um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, but the the analogy that I like to use is of the Superman comics. Mm -hmm. So when they first started the Superman comics, he, he could lift a car. You know, he was pretty strong. He was obviously good looking and he could do things that normal people couldn't do. And as the comics went on, they kept adding these new feats. He could fly, he could break airplanes in half. He could, he was indestructible, right? He, he was completely invulnerable. And because of all of his power, the comics started losing traction. You know, people don't want to read a comic or watch a show where it, there's not any struggle. There's no hardship. There's mm. not even a question about whether or not he's going to win or you know even how close it's going to be there's no competition and so you already know the outcome of the story before it even begins mm. and it's not relatable either because yeah. as humans we all have struggles we all have vulnerabilities we all have issues and things that we have to overcome that's part of what makes the hero's journey as a story archetype right that's what makes it so powerful is that it is, it's the story that we live every day. And so with Superman, they brought kryptonite into the mix, not to make him weak or to kill him, but to revive the series. Because kryptonite added a new dimension of vulnerability to Superman. Mm. It made it so that you didn't know if he was going to be able to defeat the villain. They could pull out some kryptonite at the last minute and render him, you know, unable to fight against them. Mm. And I sort of see that as, you know, kryptonite, it, in, in some ways, vulnerability seems like it's kryptonite. Like if you put yourself out there, people are going to freak out. They're going to think you're weird or they're going to flee away from you. But on the other side, without it, you aren't relatable. Yeah. People can't, people won't trust you. If, if you give off the, the impression that you're perfect, people know that you're not perfect because you're a human being. And so they won't trust you because there's something that's hiding in there. That's going <laughs> to come out and get them if they, yeah. if they put their trust in you. I, I love I this. Like and uh, I would say this is that, you know, the listeners of the show have heard the hero's journey many times. I'm really glad by oh, yeah. hearing this is, it's exciting. And I haven't heard the, the, the Superman analogy. I like that. The fact that 
you know, if you are too perfect as a leader, right, you don't have that, you're not relatable, right? You're, you know, you're too perfect, something's wrong. And, and like you said, everybody knows everyone's not perfect. So there's got to be something wrong. So I think the the idea of, uh, you know, that hero's journey is that is that we become more attractive to people when they see that we go through, you know, struggles and trials and difficulties, and that we have human emotions through these things. And we don't just robot our way through all problems and trials in our lives. So we become more relatable. And that also builds trust, right? So we're Absolutely. having the kind of reactions to problems that a normal person would have, right? We're not this, as you say, Superman that I, I'll just rip the plane in half, right? That's no big deal. I can take care of that, right? So so I think, you know, it's interesting. I um, When I was a young leader, I thought I had to have all the answers. I thought I had to be Superman. And, you know, 30 plus years later, I realized just the opposite, right? I have to, I have to be able to have the right questions and then be smart enough to shut my mouth and listen to my people and listen to the team and the ideas from the team. And so it's the idea of being a little more humble, a little more vulnerable, a little more relatable. And I think those things, when you have them, people are more willing to share ideas and to have that conversation and, 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 you know, and, and to, you know, help you, you know, see ideas that you might not have thought of, right? I always say that the wisdom of a team is so much more than just the ideas of one manager, right? You need to have that input. The only way you're going to get that is to be relatable and to be vulnerable and to listen, you know? So I think that's a really powerful story. Yeah, definitely. And, and, you know, to touch on something that you said there, I think it's really important to create the space because there's, there's a lot of times when your team is going to know things that you don't know. They're going to be better at specific things that, that you're not an expert in. And the reason why they're on your team is because they're an expert in whatever that is. And, and by creating that vulnerability, creating that trust, you give them the space mm -hmm. to speak up. You make it okay for them to risk being vulnerable, mm. to share their opinion, which you highly value. You know, you, they're there because of that expertise that they have. Right. And it reminds me of this um, when Alan Mulally took over at Ford. Uh, I don't know if you know much about his story, but he, um, he had these meetings with all of the executives and, and the company wasn't doing well. And he would, he'd get into these meetings and say, okay, you know, who's got something that they, they want to share and nobody would, nobody would answer. And, you know, every, every quarter or every month they'd have these meetings, who's got something to share, who's got problems that need to be solved. Nobody spoke up. And so finally he says, okay, guys, the, the company is failing. The company is not doing well. There have to be some problems somewhere. And eventually I, I think he ended up sharing his problems but he created a whole system for this and he he created a space where you know the truth was there were problems everywhere mm -hmm. but the the members in that meeting the department heads were so trained to bury it to hide it mm -hmm. to not talk about the problems because they'd get their head ripped off by previous leadership if they shared any problems and, you know, Malali's response to that was to say, no, you know, we're here in this meeting so that you can present your problem. We can all put our heads together. We can figure out a solution and we can fix it. And that's how we're going to fix the company is by fixing everyone's problems. Mm. And, you know, the rest is history. Yeah. But yeah. Creating like that, that space is really important. Yeah. I like that a lot. I, I think, you know, um, I've written about this before, you know, when you have an organization that um, runs on fear, right? That um, people get demoted or fired or, you know, moved away when they share bad news or they or there's mistakes made. Um, then people start clamming up. People start hiding the bad news, right? And so, you know, I worked at a company. We used to call it the good news company because there was never any bad news. It was all good, right? And we went to meetings and it was all good. No one said anything bad. So similar to Ford, nobody wanted to say anything. It was bad because they knew you're going to get your head chopped off if you did. So we all shared good news only. And uh, that's a problem, right? Because then, then the leadership is not facing reality. They're living in a, you know, a fantasy. And, uh, and that's, a, that's a major problem. And many, many big companies have had major failures because they weren't facing reality. They were just listening to the, the good news from yes men and women. 
right? They weren't <laughs> getting the real truth. So, yeah, that's yeah. like uh, Jim Collins' concept of the hedgehog concept from good mm -hmm. to great, yeah. where you have to be brutally honest about the reality of the situation and yet completely um, optimistic and dive all in and go after that ambitious goal. Yeah, yeah. That's, um, you know, especially as entrepreneurs, that's a hard thing to do, right? So you have to face the reality. You know, I, I started my business five and a half years ago. You have to face the harsh reality that you learn that cash is king very quickly as an entrepreneur, right? So when you have to make payroll every two weeks, right? So you know about cash. So you face the reality of your current situation, yet you're, you know, 100% convinced that you're going to overcome these challenges. You're going to reach your end, end game. And you have to have both of those ideas in your head at, at all at all times. And you can't ignore one or the other, right? So you can't get too mm -hmm. tied up in your, oh, woe was me. I don't have any cash or this is going to happen or this is, you know, there's a lawsuit and this and that. You get too tied up in that, you're not focused on your vision. But if you get too focused on your vision and you, you ignore the reality of what's happening, you're going to be in bad shape as well. So yeah, you got to keep your eyes uh, <laughs> eyes on both uh, as a, as an entrepreneur. That's certainly I've learned that in the past five yeah. years. That's for sure. So let's talk about. Uh, so I, I was reading that you wrote uh, you published every day for a year. Is that right? Close. So I, I I published about three hundred and thirty. Um, okay, that's I'm going to call that. That's good. In a year. So in a year. yeah. So, but the so um, <laughs> what was ahead. that like? So so what did you learn through? doing that and uh and what was the kind of response that you had from um you know from people who are reading these uh the content yeah uh so i still do publish almost every day i okay. i write every day uh this year i think i'm gonna hit a little less than uh 330 but i'll be in that 300 to 330 range and um you know for me it the goal at the beginning wasn't necessarily to be perfect about it and write every single day, but it was to develop that habit of writing every day. And so I'm not, um, I'm not religious about it, but I do write as often as I can. And, and part of that is just because I'm kind of a hundred or zero type of person. I don't really see the, the value in writing three days a week, for example, uh, if it's, and this is not, a good thing all the time don't, you know don't get me wrong yeah, like this yeah. can be very bad but in the case with writing it's easier to just always write or never write than yeah. to try to decide oh you know i'm kind of tired this morning i didn't sleep well last night you, know, you start to make these excuses and talk yourself yeah. out of it so on that side of things sort of the mechanical side of things is it's just easier to write every day but i, I started this habit because a lot of the entrepreneurs and and in the space that I'm in, which is kind of the online business coaching and consulting, a lot of the people who are successful were also doing this. They were writing every single day and publishing something to their audience. And so I made the commitment, you know, when I got serious about starting my business in, in the beginning of 2020, that I was going to write every day and uh, see where it goes. You know, I figured, okay, I'll maybe have 365 pieces of content and hopefully I'll become a little bit better of a writer in the process. Um, but that's sort of the linear outlook. And as humans, we're very, we tend to see everything linearly, but it's also, there's a lot of habits that work non-linearly, right? So mm -hmm. take exercise, for example. If you go to the gym, and you train, uh, you know, you train chest four weeks in a row, you know, one day a week, four weeks in a row, you're probably not going to see much progress, right? But the more you train, the stronger you get. And, you know, it, it does sort of taper off at, at the end, you know, it's not a true exponential in that it just goes straight up, but you start to get more benefits over time after doing things, they don't come immediately. And, and this is why a lot of people struggle with keeping habits like meditation or exercise or writing is a lot of the benefits don't come until later on after mm. you've already given up because you didn't see any progress, right? And I found that by writing and, and the way that I structure my writing is that I was also able to write a book 
I wrote a full length course that I teach. I wrote, uh, I ended up doing like eight months because I didn't start at the beginning of the year, but eight months of a monthly training series that I run. And all of that came out of that daily writing habit. And I was able to break everything down. You know, you don't necessarily have to start at this point. Uh, I mean, if, if you're trying to start writing and start communicating with your audience, which really is the, you know, that's where the rubber meets the road with the content creation is you're consistently getting in touch with them. You're building a relationship, you're building trust. You're showing them that you're out there. Like we talked about, you're in this battle with them, leading them on the journey to whatever that destination is. The, um, there's a really popular internet marketer who has this saying, he, he says, more equals more. And the idea is that the more content that you create, the more you get in front of them, the more, the more quickly you're going to build a relationship, the more sales you're gonna make and the, the, the better your business is gonna be. So obviously you, you can't just go out there and throw a bunch of junk out there, right? You gotta put out high quality content. So that's, that's sort of the balance there is putting out the most amount of high quality content that you can. So how do you do that? So how do you um, every day create content that is interesting and relatable and helpful to the people that might be following you or might uh, be searching Google for a particular piece of information? How do you create good content on a daily basis? Because I think most entrepreneurs, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, you're doing some level of marketing at some point. So how do you create that kind of level of content and then make it good every day? So the first thing I'll say is to forget everything that you've ever heard from any sort of business guru or marketing expert online. The, um, I, I think a lot of them have good intentions, but in the process of trying to systematize and make a step-by-step -step process for here's how you create content, it's made everything look and sound exactly the same. And there's sort of this effect where if I go on Facebook or Instagram and I, I can look at people's content and often I can tell what programs they've taken, what courses they've gone through because I can read their content and I know they're following the templates and the systems from specific courses that I've taken or that I've been exposed to. And that's, that is the worst thing that you can have happen when you're trying to have people notice your work. You know, there's this sort of, there's this idea called serendipity. And it's that, um, well, so one day I was, I was driving around and I pulled up to a stoplight next to a Range Rover. And I looked, looked at it and I thought, you know, I don't think I would ever spend that much money on a car. You know, it's just not really my thing. And, and then I thought to myself, and I think a lot of other people must agree with me because I never see Range Rovers ever. And now every day when I drive, I see Range Rovers. Every single day I see them because I made that switch in my mind. You know, there's, there's so much information, whether it's auditory or visual or um, whatever, you're, you're being bombarded all the time with so much information that your brain the only way to handle it is to shut it all off. And so you're really only focusing on new things and things that are important to you. And so when I noticed that Range Rover, that became something that passed through the filter. And so if your content sounds exactly the same as everyone else's, it doesn't even pass the filter. It's not that people aren't interested in what you do or that your content's bad or you're a bad writer or you're not good on video or whatever it is. It's just that their brains are being bombarded with so much information that they don't even know that you exist, even if they look at your content and even double tap it and give it a like, right? It's so easy to like stuff. And so you can get the wrong idea about, you know, I'm getting these likes, but I'm not getting any sales or I'm not getting any opt-ins. People will just don't even know that you exist. Yeah. And I, so I like, I like that a lot. What you're saying is that um, we're living in a world where everyone's looking and, and acting the same, right? It's, it's everybody's following the same formulas. Like, okay, you know, you got to do, you know, 
the, your content should be this. You should you should say these these words. So this is good for search engines. This is that, and so every piece of content you look at looks kind of the same. It's kind of um, there's a lot of noise. And so what you're saying is, how do I rise above the noise? How do I make my content unique and different? So how do you do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And so, yeah, unique is exactly what I'm shooting for. And I, my goals with content are to entertain them, you know, give them something that they look forward to every day, but also something that's valuable mm -hmm. and not necessarily five ways to get better on your Instagram stories or, you know, not, not those types of things, but trying to change the way they think about the problems that they have. And so really what I do is, you know, to get down to the, the, the big question here, right? We've kind of been dancing around it for a minute here, but what I do is I tell stories from my own life. I tell stories from things that I see happening on the internet, on the news. Uh, at this point, they pretty much just come to me, but I've spent a lot of time practicing and just looking. A lot of people think they don't have anything to write about. They don't have any inspiration, but they're not looking at what's going on in their own life for inspiration. And it really can be anything. You know, I, I teach, you know, coaches and course creators how to create better content, how to be better leaders, how to position themselves in ways to get more business, right? Ultimately. But you know, yesterday, I, or I guess that was this morning, I was writing about, um, my, I told you before we got on the show here, my brother is road tripping from Seattle to Charlotte and he's, uh, he's moving out to Charlotte. And so him and my dad have been driving. They just went through, uh, went and saw Mount Rushmore yesterday and they sent me some pictures. You know, I've never been before and wow, it was, it just blew me away. Um, you, know, you and I mean, even to see, you can see the pictures online. It's a little bit better to see the pictures that they took standing in front of it but I'm sure it's just incredible to be there to see it and it, it just gave me an appreciation of our history as a country and you know our forefathers and the people who came before us and so I wrote about that this morning oh, that's and great. you know tomorrow I'm gonna write about uh I had an idea <laughs> so so okay this is this is a really good point because i learned this the hard way I, I i wrote it down and it's in my notes in my phone which it's not coming to me right now but oftentimes you'll get an idea and you yeah. think oh this is the best idea ever i will there's no way i could forget this idea and then you know you you're like okay i'll you know write about it tomorrow morning or whatever later today. oh it goes it it, it disappears gone, fast. completely yeah. gone yeah yeah so I, as I'm going through my day, I'm, I'm always looking for content ideas and I just have a note on my phone. I open it up and I jot something down. That's going to just jog my memory when I sit down to write. I like it. And so, you know, later tonight, I'll look at my phone and be like, oh man, I totally, <laughs> you know, I to was going to well, share that. Interesting yeah, that it's interesting that's what to I was going to about. Because uh, I think it's really important. I think that the, the, what the content that you, you need to create is just around what's familiar to you, what you're seeing and what, what sparks ideas. I know my, I usually write once a week. I know I'm a slacker, right? 52 a year. <laughs> no, there's nothing wrong with but that. I, but I also run a full-time business. So I guess I have an excuse. But uh, anyways, uh, but I always try to, it's something that triggers uh, a story. And I was listening to Joe Rogan uh, going mm -hmm. into work uh, the other day. And he said something that sparked an idea. And then it, you know, it kind of related back to a story for, that's even in my book, but I never looked at it from the angle that, Joe yeah. Rogan, his guests were talking about. And it was like, so what do I, I don't, uh, when I'm driving, I don't write things down. What I do is I leave voice messages for myself. Mm -hmm. So all you have to do is just tell her, you know, Siri, take a uh, voice message and you, you can leave a little message. So I leave those messages to myself all the time. So I don't forget them, but I think you're right. I think we can look for, we can look for ideas of things to talk about in our everyday life. Right. And what is, what are you, what are you observing and what are you, what, what are you seeing? But I think what you're, you're saying is that you've got to intentionally look for those things. You can't just be passive. You have to be a little more active with, you know, your observations of the world. And then you have some stories that are very relatable to people like, Oh yeah, I've been to Mount Rushmore or, 
or I've always wanted right. to go there and this makes a lot of sense. And so you, you tell stories that are relatable and, and are, that are personal. And like you were talking about earlier, it's just authentic, right? It's your authentic self versus it's some canned, you know, five ways to whatever. I'm, I'm quick yeah. baby kind of stuff. So, exactly. Yeah, that everybody is tired of these days. So this is great. Well, I think, um, Andrew, you've shared a lot of really good uh, ideas for our audience. And I think, um, you know, I think there's a lot of powerful stories that you've shared that I think are going to help all of us. So how can uh, people find out more about what you do, what you write about, um, you know, how to connect with you? Yeah. So if you want to get better at your content creation, maybe you want to start creating content, you want to build that habit. If you want to know what to write about, how to write it, I have a whole bunch of training on my website at andrewbwriter.com. And uh, yeah, you can uh, opt in for my email list. Like I said, like we established, I write almost every day, but <laughs> I'm not perfect. Stuff comes up sometimes. So, um, you know, I, I think whether it's through the training where I break down the mechanics or through the emails where you can look at sort of a case study to improve your content, uh, I try to provide a whole range of options. Oh, that's great. Are you there? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. I just froze up a little second. Okay. Oh, okay. That's great. Uh, so outstanding. So we'll put that link in the uh, show notes so people can find you. And, you know, I'll say this to all the, the entrepreneurs, leaders that are listening in is that, you know, everybody knows that cash is king, but I would say this is that content is king too. So if you want to represent your business well online, you have to be able to create effective content for your, uh, your customers or potential customers. And that has to be authentic. It has to be real and it has to be engaging. And I think what Andrew has shared here today is something that's really important for, I know for my business and I know it's important for your business as well. So um, I highly encourage you to link up with Andrew and learn more about how to do this. So he's been doing it. And uh, hey, I challenge anybody on this uh, who's listening in, can you write content for a full year, one day a year for a full year? I know I would struggle with that. So I'm really impressed, Andrew, that you have gone <laughs> down you. the highway and you and you've, you had the self-discipline to be able to carry that out. So that's powerful. So uh, really, I appreciate you being on the show and sharing all your ideas and thoughts on leadership with us. Yeah, thanks, John. I appreciate you having me on. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well.